So it's time for the main events of the night. Uh, Professor Demento from UCI Law School, who graciously gave us his time to give a talk called en Engineering, Infrastructure, and Social Justice. Before we start, I'm going to ask everybody to keep their mics off and to type any questions that you have in the chat. We'll have an open uh, Q&A session at the end of the talk. So uh, just send those questions out. Uh, OK. Professor Demento has decades of interdisciplinary teaching experience at UC Irvine, including at the School of Law, Social Ecology, and the Paul Mirage School of Business, directed our Newkirk Center for Science and Society, and completed research at our Institute of Transportation Studies. He's written a, double, a dozen books and taught courses on a wide variety of subjects, including international law, urban and regional planning, and domestic and international environmental law, and conflict resolution. He also wrote a book called Changing Lanes, which covers the story of the evolution of the urban freeway, the competing visions that informed it, and the emerging alternatives for more sustainable urban transportation. In his talk, the professor will address how engineers must reckon and atone for in infrastructure's role in racial injustice and a personal professional responsibility. Everybody, please give a warm welcome to Professor Joseph F.C. Demento. I'll hand the meeting off to you. Thank you very much. Is, uh, is it time for me to share my screen or is it up? Uh, you can go ahead and share. How does that come through, Keenan? Looks great. Thanks, Professor. Good. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I would just say if there are any technical problems or questions that come in the chat room that you need to communicate to me, I'll ask Keenan to let me know that somehow. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here and it's it's wonderful to see your group taking the initiative uh, and to address these issues. Of course, one can't live in this country uh, historically, but most, uh, most clearly uh, in these last months without focusing on uh, social and racial justice. So your request um, to talk about uh, the history of the American highway system, its impacts on, um, on, uh, on uh, non-represented people, uh, uh, Black Americans, uh, comes at a very good time. But you also asked to uh, address the challenge of engineering systematic superiority of judgment. And I, I said to Keenan, I'm not sure I can do that. Uh, uh, my brother's an engineer, my, my cousins are engineers. I, they are pretty much focused on racial justice. So I, I don't think any one uh, profession is particularly um, the culprit in, these, in this long and uh, tragic history. And I also was asked to pose a potential ways engineers can hold themselves accountable to society and discuss solutions to increasing equity. Sure, I can do that, but I also would hope in the discussion that you will, including based on what you're worried about, what you're upset about, but also your experiences. I've been involved in uh, the world of planning and law and infrastructure and transportation for a long time. Uh, I began with uh, the beginning of the environmental law movement uh, years ago. I've been involved from its roots, including from time, a time when the term environmental law did not include the notion of environmental justice, not explicitly. In fact, when it was first introduced into the curriculums, it was seen as something that maybe just didn't belong uh, in, uh, in classic uh, uh, legal analysis with that focus on the environment. That quickly changed. I teach land use and development control law. By the way, I teach it uh, 
uh, to students other than law students and two of the best students I ever had were in, uh, from engineering. I write about climate change uh, and uh, uh, as Keenan pointed out, I write about freeways and, and that may have been um, uh, the trigger for inviting me to come. And I will talk about freeways, but I won't talk only about freeways. There is an extraordin extraordinarily uh, well-received, although with anything related to race and, and law, uh, not universally uh, well-received uh, book that has come out called The Color of Law. And in that book, the author uh, uh, from Berkeley uh, summarizes uh, an important lesson for where, uh, where we are in 2020. We didn't get here by accident. We didn't get to a situation where racial justice is still an aspiration. We got here through a shameful history. Uh, and so uh, we will talk about some of that history and how the law has played a not so good role. But also I hope I can point out that the law has, can also play and has played a positive role. What, uh, our professions can do for justice is something we will talk about, I will talk about, and I hope you will. But also we're not just engineers or lawyers or professors, uh, we're also citizens. And much of what we do uh, should come from our role as citizens, not just our role as civil engineers or mechanical engineers or environmental law professors. Well, uh, we tend to work uh, together, lawyers, engineers, and planners on many, many major projects. And uh, I thought I'd put this into context by looking at some of the uh, uh, projects that uh, are uh, challenging and exciting and uh, impactful uh, in Southern California. Those that have uh, raised controversy, brought in economic development uh, and also affected communities in very different ways. The Los Angeles Times did a piece on uh, some of the major big projects that are coming forward in Southern California and wrote that it, these projects provide the region with a glim glimpse of a future beyond its present day problems, struggles in the streets, global pandemic, unemployment and homelessness. Big projects do that, but big projects can also uh, be very disruptive and uh, unjust in their impacts. Big projects are not always neutral. Where you site light rail lines, where the toxic dumps go, the route of the bullet train, and infrastructure of so many, in, of so many other types. Uh, transfer stations uh, are built. Uh, this is one uh, near the 60 and 215 in, in Riverside County. Uh, they're built in ways that bring economic growth to the Inland Empire, but they also have impacts on people's lives, on people's homes on communities that were there before Amazon and uh, others uh, needed to tran uh, transport so many goods and services uh, from uh, all over the world throughout the United States. These are projects that affect people who live in communities that uh, would be better off, uh, not on the economic side, but in this uh, uh, quality of life on a daily basis without large freeways and large mega buildings uh, um, as neighbors. Uh, we all work together in building uh, fantastic uh, structures uh, like uh, this extraordinary bridge going in uh, uh, that has just opened uh, and uh, from Long Beach uh, to San Pedro. 
and the immensely controversial, exciting in many ways, uh, a long, long story about the bullet train, where it will go, how far it will go, whether it will be of um, value to the communities it is going through, as you see in this, this is a picture, this is not a rendering, this is a photograph, uh, what its impacts will be on the communities uh, it will serve. Not to mention, and, and I've always been a supporter of the bullet train in concept, not to mention the immense amount of public funds that goes, uh, that uh, will go into this project and not go into other projects. Another mega project of the $5 billion people mover. I suppose it's time we have a people mover as uh, we talk a little bit about the uh, Century Freeway and the Green Line, the light rail that goes uh, along the Century Freeway. Some of you might say, well, why didn't go, it go to LAX? And now uh, 30 years, 25 years later, perhaps uh, it will be going to LAX and the, the, exactly when, I don't know when it would be completed. That's at the big level, the mega level, the things people get excited about, the things people in Europe know about what's going on uh, that we do as engineers and planners and, and, and lawyers. But there are other things we do that have considerable impacts on society in different ways that are more humble. We build walls, we build mixed use communities, we build commercial buildings, uh, we build housing of very different kinds. We build housing for the rich, we try to build housing for the not so rich. Uh, we're more successful in doing it for higher income people. We work in gentrifying areas. We bring economic development to places that maybe need it or maybe are only perceived as needing it or maybe don't want it, uh, at least not in the form that uh, these projects uh, uh, are, are coming into form. We build super streets. I'm not talking about freeways now, but streets that have impact on walkability through communities like Irvine and, and other suburban uh, developments. We build walls. Uh, this is an extraordinary story. I have, uh, uh, I was educated in my graduate education in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we would go to Detroit regularly. Uh, and we always talked about eight mile. Uh, some of my white friends said, well, no, that's on the other side of eight mile. And I didn't know what they meant until they explained it. It is an area uh, historically that the whites were on one side of eight mile north and the uh, uh, blacks were on the other side. But what was extraordinary as you go deeper into this history, this is a picture of a wall that was built between the black and the white seg segments of Detroit. How did this happen? It happened because of the law. It happened because of redlining. It happened because of financial institutions. After uh, the war, many black Americans from the South came to Detroit to work in, uh, in the uh, auto factories and for other uh, economic reasons. And they lived in uh, a black communities. Uh, a developer wanted to build a new community for white people. Yes, build it for white people. And uh, because of redlining, the process of banks not uh, loaning uh, for developments in which black people lived or were to live or even walked through in its most extraordinary uh, manifestation. And because of the federal government's involvement in that process, uh, the, uh, the project would not have been built unless the developer literally built a wall between the black section and the white section. That wall now happily is more colorful. If you Google eight mile Detroit, the wall, you'll see it is uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in a, 
in 2020 now there is uh, a, a use of color and a use of, uh, of, of the wall as a means of, of describing history. Another element re related to uh, uh, justice and is uh, climate injustice. This is an extraordinary story that the New York Times did on the basis of very good uh, urban and regional planning, a uh, quantitative analysis and uh, digitizing maps uh, that superimpose temperatures on um, uh, red lined uh, communities. Communities that did not, uh, 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 were not allowed to um, have home ownership because the, uh, the banks would not loan to black people or projects that would, uh, homes that would be built for black people. And this remarkable study shows how the uh, areas in which redlining occurred were areas that are now up to 5%, uh, five degrees uh, hotter absent the a absent any kinds of local parks absent any kinds of green communities so that black community black people in these areas ha literally have to cross town to have the relief of um, of the parks that were built in other parts of the community so decisions about redlining had impacts on minority communities not only in their ability to own but also in their ability to um, live a comfortable life, uh, most, um, uh, most seriously in the summer and as we see the impacts of climate change. So this has to do with us in many ways. Uh, uh, we work for the public sector or we will, or we may work for the private sector in industry. We may work on major infrastructure structure projects, or we may work on humble small projects. But all of these are not uh, neutral um, entities. Uh, all of these um, uh, activities that we are involved in are, are activities that create projects that have differential impacts. And they have differential impacts based on how we respond to the client, or we may be the client, um, how we try to influence the client, how we try to educate the client. And I think this uh, is um, uh, true for each of our, uh, our, our uh, professions. I see tonight as a chance uh, for some self-reflection uh, uh, to inquire what we need to ask when considering our professional opportunities. And uh, there is a wide ranging conversation that has been going on for years, but is immensely uh, alive right now about whether the injustices in our society are structural, uh, whether they are created by a government, whether they are created by corporate America, or whether corporate America simply reflects what our uh, the attitudes and orientations of all of us. I don't think we have to take a position on that. It probably is both, but independent of what the sources are, uh, we can uh, reflect on what our roles are in projects ranging from freeways uh, to uh, uh, multi-use uh, commercial buildings. Some of what we, I think, led uh, all of us to think about self-reflection, me more uh, over the years, you uh, perhaps over the years as well, but each of our pr uh, professions can uh, benefit from the introspection that Keenan and you folks have called for uh, in this wonderful idea of this session. We develop standard operating procedures as lawyers, as planners, uh, as, as engineers. And our education is limited um, within the context of 
what we need to do to learn those standard procedures, to learn the, the principles that guide the construction of bridges or of roads. Um, sadly, and I, I used to be involved uh, with the graduate division on trying to increase the number of electives in engineering. Uh, I don't know, uh, perhaps in the chat, you can tell me if there is even room for courses other than engineering courses. At one point at, in my long career at UCI, there was very little room. I, as I mentioned the, when Keenan asked me to do this, my, men my message, and this is not a message, I'm not preaching, I'm exploring this with you, is not that engineers are a particularly unconcerned group. They're a group, they're Americans, they're uh, citizens, they're, they care about other people. They happen to be engineers. So let's talk about how this manifests itself in some cases. One of the cases that uh, I just love working on is freeways. Uh, and so uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, the strong influence of engineers in the history of freeways and how uh, that has changed to a certain extent and talk a little bit about case studies of some freeways. This is where I grew up. Uh, believe it or not, I was walking home, running home from a um, from a basketball game. Uh, I'm, I'm terrible in basketball, but I have always loved it. And it was dust. It was getting to be dark, and I got hit by a car going on, uh, not seriously, but enough to set me up uh, for a while on a, uh, a on-ramp to a freeway. And I said, I didn't even know there was a freeway going in, but this, it, this is the freeway that went through my neighborhood in its construction, um, construction uh, phase. Here is the neighborhood that was segregated from my part of uh, the city. Uh, and uh, this is somewhat of a classic in the history of American in uh, um, urban freeways. The freeways often went through either black communities or integrated, but poor, but not always blighted or not always in need of change communities. This is the, the 15th Ward in Syracuse, which uh, was predominantly Jewish and black. And these are pictures from the historical archives of that, uh, of the 15th Ward. But how did we get to urban freeways? How did this come about? What was broken? What did the future look like? Why were, were we as a nation of travelers and cars needing to do something uh, uh, in the center city uh, that would look like a freeway? Well, um, let's look back and see uh, who were the players, uh, what, what did they see as the problems in, uh, in the inner city, and uh, what did they see as the possibilities for uh, improving the situation uh, with various technologies, and the leading one that we're talking about now is urban freeways. Well, things were broken. Uh, in, in many cities throughout the country, uh, the central business district was a highly congested area. This is not an exaggerated picture. It wasn't an exaggerated picture in Syracuse. It wasn't in New Orleans. Movement of cars was very slow. Uh, the streets, uh, the, the uh, rapid increase in the use of the automobile was not uh, 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 met by the rapid increase of, uh, of the building of, of streets. Another reason was uh, there was a um, concern about the uh, degradation of the central business core. The inner city uh, was aging and it was aging in ways that some people thought needed major interventions like 
redevelopment, redevelopment funded by the federal government, redevelopment that would remove certain communities uh, that were either blighted or perceived as blighted uh, by the leadership. So commercial uh, redevelopment was another uh, aspect of the status quo. There also was the point that the suburbs had begun to be developed. This is a classic suburban scene in the 50s. Uh, and people moved to the suburbs. Some called it white flight, some called it other things. But people moved to the suburbs. And yet, at least for a while, they were working in the downtown core. They were shopping in the downtown core. They needed a way to get back and forth from the downtown core. They were white people. Uh, for the most part, the early suburbs uh, uh, were not integrated. So you put all these uh, 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 historical factors together and the idea came up that uh, let us try to move uh, for these purposes of decongestion, uh, um, uh, uh, keeping the central business district alive and redeveloping the central business district, the notion that uh, maybe the interstate freeway system that was being built under Dwight Eisenhower that would go from uh, uh, the, the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean uh, should also uh, serve the needs of uh, inner cities. So. It, it, as I said, I truly enjoy uh, studying urban freeways. This is a graphic of an early concept of a downtown urban freeway. Uh, it seems like they uh, had part of the concept correct. Uh, what happens uh, at the end of that particular, uh, those particular lanes is another matter. But they did at the time, uh, this does not look like uh, an urban freeway, uh, the 405 or the, uh, the 210, but there were models of, free of parkways that were beautiful and non-congested and allowed for Sunday drives and allowed for moves uh, throughout uh, uh, a state. And so that vision was part of the um, the motivation to say, well, maybe this would be something that could assist in the urban freeway, I mean, in the urban uh, situation that was faced. It was not hurt in its, uh, and the, exc uh, the excitement grew in, in part because of the marketing activities of the major automobile manufacturers. This is a picture from Futurama, the 1939 World's Fair. And um, Futurama was a Disney-like project, it wasn't Disney, uh, that uh, allowed people to see what the world would look like in the future with the uh, 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 addition, uh, uh, with the development of uh, modern ways of building cities and modern ways of moving people through cities. This is uh, uh, a model of what the future city would look like. And these people are uh, watching, uh, are at the World's Fair looking at, uh, with uh, quite great interest about what it might look like. And at that World's Fair, uh, the uh, designer Bill Bel Geddes uh, provided wonderful pictures of what the world would look like uh, with urban freeways and how the future would be one. And you could, you could go on YouTube uh, and hear uh, the excitement of the narrator about how the world will be so much better uh, in the future. And the future by at that point was 1960. So this is what the world would look like in 1960 based on the ideas of uh, Bel Geddes and the, uh, the development of the urban freeway. You see uh, segregated movement for cars and for people integrated with the downtown. At, at that time, uh, uh, at the same time as the development of the 
uh, of the ideas in, uh, at Futurama and so on, the federal government was moving forward with its interstate system. And uh, uh, a book came out, Toll Rolls and Free Roads, uh, free roads that address the concept of how do we finance and where do we put east, west, and north, south roads for a national system of transportation. Uh, the Bureau of Public Roads rejected the idea of tolls that has come back to a certain extent um, and accepted the notion of a free way and one that went through cities and gave suggestions for inserting roads into urban environments. And this slide shows um, that at, by 1947, uh, 40,000 miles of freeways had been mapped. Almost 3,000 were in urban areas. The Association of State Highway Officials uh, began to uh, look at, uh, uh, offer ideas for uh, design including uh, geometric design, spacing and interchanges, and minimum widths. So some got built. And I will talk a little bit about those that uh, I have studied in, and my colleague, Professor Ellis, have studied in detail. People have asked me quite a lot in the last couple of years, were they built to wipe out um, blighted areas and to remove African Americans from downtown communities. I have to be very careful when I answer that. We did in-depth studies of three cities, but we did also cameos of other cities, and these are some of the other cities. You probably all were born in cities either near or with urban freeways. Uh, no matter where you live in the United States or, else, uh, or in some other countries. Some of these freeways, it was quite clear, including through our research, that the motivation was to remove African-Americans from the downtown core, to replace what was perceived as blighted um, uh, housing, and other structures with redeveloped structures to take money that was being set aside, uh, made available for urban freeways because the federal government financed to a great extent the freeway system and to use that uh, at the same time to remove um, the uh, central business district less desirable in the eyes of some uh, in, uh, inner city. Who was involved in, in those activities? Well, we all were, but our book uh, looked at, looks in depth at who were the leading thinkers and who, who held the cards with regard to uh, the siting of urban freeways. And engineers were on top of the list. Planners, the planning field really hadn't even developed uh, much by 1950. Uh, they played some role some of them thought that the approach that was being uh, advocated was not wise for the health of the, of, of the city, uh, but they were somewhat marginalized, as were architects and landscape architects, all involved, but in more marginal roles. At the same time uh, uh, as regular professionals were uh, involved in, in these discussions, there was an ongoing serious discussion about should the great city builders like Robert Moses uh, dominate uh, what would happen in the, uh, in, the, in the inner cities or should um, Jane Jacobs with her view of uh, the, the neighborhood the walking community, uh, the preservation of historical buildings. So that's very much a part of the background uh, discourse that was going on. Uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, a few freeways. And this is something that uh, I, I have a couple 
good friends in the audience tonight who are engineers. And uh, this is part of the situation that maybe is more of an engineering mentality than other areas. Uh, the yellow book was put out by the federal government and that showed where the freeways would go. And you see in this picture, the shortest distance between uh, two points is a straight line, not so straight, but pretty straight. And on, in almost all of the yellow book maps, the freeways went right through the cities. Uh, they were, uh, 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 did so on the basis of, uh, in large part, of efficiency. One of the freeways we studied, here is a, a, a beloved park uh, uh, in Memphis, uh, was to go right through the zoo and the, uh, uh, this beautiful beloved park. It was stopped. Los Angeles, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, our Century Freeway was not stopped. It, actually, it was stopped for a decade, but it was not stopped permanently. It was changed and the law's influence is interesting in this case. Here is the Century Freeway Corridor, what it looked like when these cities, including Linwood, were considered model cities and given awards for walkability, uh, uh, for livability. And this is what that same community looks like today. The freeway of the century is the Century Freeway. And uh, it did get influenced by the law in a very, perhaps not completely successful, but a very uh, comprehensive way. The Century Freeway, after a lawsuit brought by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and many other uh, plaintiffs, uh, was stopped, uh, went to the courts, the courts sided with the plaintiffs, and the courts created uh, a, a program where uh, some of the negative impacts of going through these cities would be uh, mitigated by design, by requiring active participation of those who were to be affected, by uh, involving the landscape architects in a more uh, uh, active way to decrease the negative aesthetic impacts of freeways through Linwood and uh, the nine cities through which it went, by requiring through the federal government uh, and a consent degree, I mean, the federal lawsuit, uh, the Green Line, a transit uh, uh, a light rail to go through the communities. There was not a light rail in the uh, original Century Freeway. Not only that, to require uh, employment of those who were, those who were uh, displaced by uh, the freeway. Uh, and not only employment of uh, people of color, but uh, of women and of businesses owned by women. And also the creation of housing stock to replace that which had been removed. Very different than when the earlier freeways like Syracuse uh, were put through the other cities. This is the, um, uh, the consent decree involving uh, the Caltrans versus uh, the plaintiffs in the case. And uh, this, uh, a friend of mine uh, uh, started the Center for Law in the Public Interest, and he um, uh, brought, they brought the lawsuit uh, that led to the consent decree. You see, some of us have been around quite a while. Mary Nichol Nichols uh, was uh, a counsel on, uh, on, the, on, this, uh, on this brief. Mary Nichols, the head of the Air Resources Board uh, now. So the different outcomes in the three cities uh, had to do um, with uh, timing to a large, uh, large extent when they came in. So, 
the law has taken away. Uh, the law has taken away uh, opportunities for uh, African Americans uh, and other people of color. It has done so through redlining. It is done through uh, restrictive covenants, which precluded until the 50s you from selling a house to a black person. Uh, that was not declared unconstitutional until a, several decades ago. So the law and uh, my course this year, we've added the element of land and land use and development control of the, the racial and justice focus. The law did take a lot away uh, from uh, people of color, but the law has also played a role in seeking greater justice. And uh, the reason, one, one way of looking at the freeways that I talked about, if you put on one end of the continuum Syracuse and on the other end of the continuum, uh, the Century Freeway, in that interim, all of these laws were passed. Section four of the Department of Transportation Act, which was essential to uh, uh, decision-making about uh, 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 freeways that, uh, uh, needing to uh, mitigate, to provide an analysis of alternatives to the uh, routes that uh, were chosen. The National Historic Preservation Act requiring uh, a look at the impact that the freeway and other infrastructure would have on the important historical uh, uh, resources the Federal Aid Highway Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Clean Air Act, and relocation laws. All of these were federal laws and there were uh, cousins at the state that required um, decision makers not simply to say, oh, we checked with the mayor and we can go forward with this. No, there had to be very um, time consuming, comprehensive analysis of the impacts of these proposed freeways on the communities that they would affect. So let me check the time. Uh, what will we all be doing uh, as we re-engineer uh, urban freeways? Are we going to repair them? Are we going to reverse engineer them? Or are we going to re-envision them? What I'm looking at now, uh, there's a huge literature and a very strong media interest on taking down the freeways. And if you follow that perhaps too closely, you'd think that that was the leading strategy uh, uh, promoted by cities. Uh, they have been taken down in Milwaukee. They've been taken down in many cities throughout the country. Rochester, Syracuse, after 10 years, is still waiting for a decision uh, on taking it down uh, and, and uh, re um, um, changing the route. Uh, the, the video, uh, the graphic on the right is, well, and on the left is Seoul, Korea. When I first visited Seoul, uh, the the freeway on the left would be a very moderate day. When I uh, arrived on the occasions I would visit, you would not know it was a road. It seemed like a parking lot during Christmas shopping at South Coast Plaza. But uh, the idea was, uh, this is too much and look what Seoul has changed it into, a beautiful urban park. That's not gonna happen everywhere. But it doesn't mean that we in our roles cannot work to um, mitigate the impacts on, uh, on communities of color on, uh, in the inner city. And not only mitigate, but as the consent decree did, provide opportunities for them. So uh, keep calm and ask you guys, uh, uh, what should we talk about now? What are your questions, your comments? Should we talk about other projects where some opportunities for uh, making a difference on the social justice side uh, can be uh, realized? Uh, and 
I would say, uh, uh, as I wait for your comments, when we've been looking at this at the law school and saying we need to address uh, social justice and racial injustice in all of our courses, some professors have said, my course has nothing to do with that. How can my course have anything to do with it? And others have responded, that means you haven't asked. Everything we do has justice implications, whether you're teaching torts or land use or property or tax or intellectual property, uh, the, uh, or, or whether you're studying mechanical engineering or aerospace, uh, there are implications for uh, what you do that are linked to justice. This uh, article appeared in uh, uh, one of your uh, uh, your publications uh, recently. We need to talk about systemic racism in infrastructure. We can talk now for a few minutes, and I hope we will keep talking. Uh, this is my last slide because I miss seeing you all you and on campus. I, I'm out there every morning, and this is what I see, and we've got to somehow use this infrastructure more effectively in the next, hopefully next six months. Keenan, are there questions, comments? Uh, let's see. Thanks so much, Professor. That was a really insightful talk. Um, it seems like Josh had a question you want me to read it. How about something big like the Olympics? I know that something of that scale is actually exempt from typical environmental analysis required by the state. The Olympics. Wow. Yes. Uh, how about it? Well, you'll all be involved, although LA, the last time we had it, uh, had one of the more uh, successful Olympics. But oftentimes, massive amounts of money are used uh, for structures that are beautiful and uh, sometimes not used at all after the Olympics. So I think there's all kinds of opportunities for our, us to try to influence uh, the Olympic uh, uh, programmers to build in ways that the buildings can be useful the, the stadiums and the fields can be useful for uh, people uh, 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 in the inner city after. I think it's also important that we make sure that environmental impact analysis is undertaken, that we make sure that to the extent we can affect uh, that uh, minority engineers and Construction firms are involved in the projects and Los Angeles is fairly advanced in, in, with regard to this. Uh, but I think it's, it, it's going to be very interesting to follow. On the environmental side, and during the last LA Olympics, it was one of the few times in my life here, my long life in Southern California, where the air quality was so fine and one could move if you uh, chose to move through up and down the uh, freeways uh, quite quickly in part because uh, uh, of the closing of employment centers during that period. My dear friend Lee has his hand up. Hi, Joe, that was a great talk. Thanks, Lee. I enjoyed it very much. When I saw the title of your talk, I was very puzzled. I hadn't. I really didn't understand the connection between transportation and racial equality, but now I do, and I appreciate that. That's that's very interesting. Um, I had kind of a off the wall kind of question. <clears throat> One thing that we've noticed uh, during the last six months is the differing needs for transportation for employment. Uh, a large sector of the country is able to work remotely and as a result, without having to commute, whereas a very large sector of our country is unable to do that. And that division seems to also be highly correlated with, with race and ethnic circumstances. Um, do we, you know, we have, we kind of, we, we view transportation pretty much to the same today as we've had for the last 30 or 40 years. There hasn't been a change, but I think, I wonder if you would 
guess that are we on the verge of perhaps a revolution in transportation, maybe brought on partly by COVID, but also by economic concerns? Um, are we going to get to a situation where, you know, those that are forced to use transportation to make a living are going to be in a completely different class and situation than many of those, including us, frankly, who do not have to do that. What, how, do you, how do you view that coming and changing in the next decade or so? I think you're so rightly uh, about the extent to which the impact has been so different depending on what kind of work you do and where you live. Uh, I, I think the revolution will, uh, will take place for people like us. I don't like working remotely, but it does have its benefits. But I think for those uh, uh, who can't, uh, this is going to be a challenging time, in part because the transportation systems that they need must be funded uh, by, uh, by the public. Uh, user fees aren't sufficient. So will there be the, the revenues to keep the bus systems going, uh, to create uh, rail systems that go, extend into communities of color? Now you can take the Green Line uh, through uh, South Central uh, and the Blue Line, but there are many parts of uh, Southern California and Los Angeles that aren't served by public transportation in an effective way. Uh, so I think that there are some true challenges uh, over the next decade for movement of people who have to go to work physically uh, and live in areas that because they're more affordable um, are distant in places. One last point. Uh, one uh, of my colleagues who represents uh, people in the Inland Empire, uh, people of color and uh, um, of lower income, has uh, taken action against uh, the state government for its approach to uh, privileging um, uh, uh, the concern with greenhouse gas emissions at the expense of people who cannot afford um, to buy lesser polluting cars, have older cars, and they're being uh, penalized uh, because of their um, in inability to uh, contribute to meeting uh, overall greenhouse gas emissions that are required by the state. So it, it is quite complicated. And I, I, I think Lee, it is something that we all need to think hard about and try to influence our decision makers uh, to take into consideration equity uh, while, while some of us are, uh, are not so hard hit uh, by uh, uh, the absence of the need to go to, uh, to the workplace. Thank you, Joe. Professor, um, Ni nee had a question. You mentioned how the law can be a proponent for social change, but how do you suggest we become a part of that process as an engineer? Great question. Well, guess what I'm gonna say a couple of weeks before November 2nd or 3rd? Vote. Vote for people whom you think uh, are concerned with these, uh, uh, these social justice issues. Uh, speak out uh, in your roles uh, as, uh, as professionals uh, on projects. Uh, be willing to take perhaps unpopular positions that, yes, that's a good idea and it's pretty and it's efficient, but how about its impact on? Uh, testify uh, at uh, local um, planning commissions and city councils and, 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 and county um, boards of supervisors. Uh, get involved with your energy engineering associations. Uh, those that like the penultimate slide are saying 
We need to think about the racist, racial implications of the work that we do and uh, help to structure what that means and how it plays out when you're building uh, light rail systems or uh, giant stadiums or uh, reaching conclusions about, uh, here's an important one, especially for transportation engineers, much of the segregation of jobs and housing uh, comes from what I think are overly optimistic um, analyses of the extent to which building um, high rise uh, residential uh, uh, buildings uh, uh, can create the opportunity for mass transit. Well, mass transit to where? And so transportation engineers and many of your colleagues uh, uh, here at UCI are, have been leaders in this, can help understand the relationship between transportation, jobs, housing, balance, um, trip generation, uh, and really what, uh, what are the quantitative analyses that uh, address whether these kinds of uh, projects actually do capture trips or whether they are simply a means, and that's an exaggeration, but to, to uh, continue on it, simply a means of allowing the developer to greater densify a high rise luxury apartment complex. Thanks, Professor. That was a great answer. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Or else I had one question. <laughs> Give you guys a few more seconds. Hmm. Tina, to, did you say you had a question? Yes. To the people who are working in uh, areas that are incredibly sensitive and they have been marginalized in a lot of ways that you talked about, like redlining, environmental racism. What's some quick takeaways that engineers should have from this and what should they be keeping in mind when they're doing their day-to-day -day work? Uh, you're so right. These are such sensitive uh, topics. And I think we have to address them as people, people who, are trying to act in ways that recognize that we've missed things uh, over the years. We've made some many serious mistakes. Some uh, we've done deliberately, some we haven't. Uh, but rather than to say that's too sensitive for me to try to help extend ourselves um, uh, uh, into these discussions and ask questions that allow us not only to try to learn more, but also to maybe offer some suggestions that are valuable, uh, that uh, 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 people of uh, more marginalized people or people of color might not expect us to be saying as older white men or, uh, or non-racial uh, 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 non minorities. So I, I, I think it's, it's very sensitive. Uh, we're having a, uh, uh, an event next uh, Monday evening, uh, a discussion of, of the film, The Last Black Man in San Francisco. And uh, I'm sure it will raise some very sensitive uh, points. And I said to my colleagues, my, one of my centers is sponsoring it. Uh, I said, I will not be uh, the person who comments. I will make comments, but we need to have people who have been um, experiencing these, uh, uh, these uh, insults. And so I think we've put together a very good panel. That's not to say you don't try, but you learn how to listen without being coward to, uh, in the sense that, God, what could I possibly say about that? If you do it in an open and anonymous way, I, I think it's valuable. Thanks, Professor. Uh, did anybody have any more questions? 
or else I think we'll, okay. Do you have time for one more question, Professor? I do. Great, thanks. I'll read out Josh's. You touched briefly about public transit options being desperately needed by historically underserved populations during COVID, yet usual funding gained through the gas tax, sales tax, et cetera, have been hit very hard. Uh, how can we still, pro sorry? The usual funding sources have been what? Yet yeah, usual funding gained through gas tax, sales tax, et cetera, have been hit very hard. How can we still okay. prioritize equitable development when our transportation revenues are greatly affected? Sorry, before you uh, start, I have um, uh, students that have to go to a class at seven. So if you need to go, don't worry. You can, <laughs> Is just, it Professor uh, Ritchie? Yes, Professor Ritchie's class. Tell him Joe kept you late. <laughs> Tell him Professor Demento kept you, but I, it's okay if you leave. Uh, yes, uh, these. This is a very, this is a very serious problem, and it, it's it's a problem in part that is uh, uh, created by some good news that uh, uh, with the uh, success of the hybrid and the, uh, the removal, at least until recently, of uh, the trend toward. Uh, cars that are more fuel efficient, the gas tax revenues have been affected quite dramatically. Um, a sales tax, I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, we seem to be spending as much, we just seem to be doing it at home. So uh, I think the, the resource question will be an important one. Again, uh, part of it comes from uh, our ability to vote. Uh, I was working for a Senator on a, uh, I was consulting to a senator on a uh, infrastructure bill that uh, he or she was going to be introducing a couple of years ago. And uh, both President Trump and uh, Mr. Biden, uh, Vice President Biden, have infrastructure as major parts of their platform. And uh, that can mean uh, influencing what the infrastructure um, projects are, who's affected, who's benefited, uh, where, where the projects uh, are cited, who's required to, to uh, what requirements are for uh, minority uh, um, businesses to be uh, uh, involved, for people of color and women, female-owned businesses to be involved, like the consent decree. So I think it's another area where politics and our uh, electoral decisions make a big difference. Thanks, Professor. Um, yeah, thank you for such detailed answers. Really appreciate it. Well, it uh, was a great pleasure. And yes, thank I, you. again, uh, I applaud you for doing this, Keenan, and your, your colleagues. Uh, uh, I, I think it says something very positive about the engineering uh, students here at UC Irvine. Thanks, you're really helping us learn a lot. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so before we go, uh, thanks to everybody who stayed throughout the talk, especially to the UCI faculty and uh, the other ASC members from our other chapters that we invited. And uh, biggest thanks to Professor Joseph F.C. Demento for taking his time to uh, give us his unique insight on social justice and engineering. So before we go, uh, if you guys could unmute and give them a big applause. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yes, pleasure. thank you, Professor. All right, have a good night, everybody.